from Bloomberg World Headquarters in New York to our TV and radio audiences worldwide. I'm David Weston. Welcome now to Balance of Power. We're going to start today with what Jonathan was just talking to Larry Kudlow about, and that is the situation surrounding President Trump and the First Lady, that diagnosis of COVID-19 overnight. And to get the latest, we turn now to Bloomberg White House reporter Mario Parker. Mario, what do we know about the, the president's condition? We heard Larry Kudlow say he talked to the president last night, has not seen him. On the other hand, we had Mark Meadows, the chief of staff, say he's seen him today. Yes, and Mark Meadows, who just uh, held a gaggle with reporters uh, less than an hour ago, uh, he acknowledged that the president is experiencing or exhibiting uh, mild symptoms of the coronavirus. He says that the president is in good spirits, that he's uh, continuing to execute the job, but he did uh, allow that the president is experiencing mild symptoms. So he's doing the job. The president said that he's going to be working from the White House. At the same time, he's changing his schedule some, isn't he? I mean, he had, for example, a lot of campaign appearances scheduled. Yes, absolutely. And he scrubbed his schedule, albeit uh, he's still holding a call uh, from the private rep from the executive mansion um, with um, seniors to talk about coronavirus. But yes, as you mentioned, he has canceled uh, his planned rally for today. Um, the campaign hasn't uh, said whether or not the other rallies that he had on deck for over the next week are canceled. But I mean, it's safe to presume that they will be as well. Uh, and that's robbing him of, of course, uh, his most potent political uh, cudgel. Yeah, indeed. Thank you so much, Mario. Great to have you with us. That's Mar Bloomberg's Mario Parker, who reports on the White House. The whole story surrounding President Trump really has to do with medicine, first and foremost. And welcome now, Dr. Jay Bhattacharya. He is professor of medicine at Stanford University. Welcome back, and thank you so much for joining us today. Really want to hear from you. Uh, what do we know, what don't we know about the president's condition at this point, given what you've heard? Uh, so from what I've heard is uh, obviously that he has a positive diagnosis of, of uh, the SARS-CoV-2 virus, COVID, the, the, the virus that causes COVID-19, and that uh, so far that he uh, his symptoms are very mild, as, as we just heard right now. Um, that, that's basically all the, the that's been put out to the public, and I don't know anything specific beyond that. Um, but, what, uh, but, Doctor, what about the path of the disease generally, though? Do we know, does the fact that you have mild symptoms at this early stage, does that tell us anything about the progress of the disease likely? Yeah, I mean, I think generally, if if it's going to progress, it'll it, it takes some time to develop into the, the the more severe symptoms. You know, week week or two maybe. Um, so I think we'll know more in, in coming days about this. Uh, we can say some things about his uh, about President Trump's risk factors and uh, what and uh, what that means for the disease. And actually, I think it's kind of important to to understand those risk factors, um, just so that the public can know what uh, what what to expect uh, for both for themselves and so also for President Trump. Um, uh, there's a couple of things. One is his age. Uh, his age makes him at, at, at a higher risk uh, for more severe disease than than someone who's much younger, or even just a little younger. Uh, so people who are at his age, the mortality rate from the disease is somewhere between two to four percent of people. So 96 out of nine, somewhere between 96 and 98 percent of people who are infected with at his age uh, survive. Uh, now and then uh, now. The, the, the probability of more severe symptoms is also higher at his age. By contrast, young people, well, let's say uh, someone under 18, it's more on the order of, uh, of mortality is more on the order of one in 10,000 or two in 10,000. So, you know, uh, 9,998 9, out of uh, uh, 10,000 people infected at under 18 will survive. Um, so I think uh, his odds of survival are quite good, actually. Yeah, it sounds like they're very good. I mean, that, that, that's very good odds. But what about uh, likelihood of having to be hospitalized? Do we know for a person of his age what the likelihood of that is? Yeah, that's that's a little. That's also higher at his age. Um, I think uh, uh, I don't. I can't give you a precise number because uh, because it, uh, it it all it the, the it, there are other kind of things you want to take into account. But uh, you know, maybe maybe uh, uh, double the mortality rate, something on the order like that, two two to three times. So let's say three to seven percent of people at his age, uh, maybe ten percent who are infected will be will be hospitalized eventually. We saw, of course, famously Boris Johnson, the prime minister of, of the UK, was hospitalized with COVID uh, nineteen uh, symptoms very early on in the epidemic. Um, but also the, the 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 majority of people who, like say, eighty to ninety percent, his even of his age, uh, end up not hospitalized. Uh, another uh, risk factor people talk about is obesity, or at least being overweight. And the president, as I understand it from his last uh, his last uh, checkup, was borderline obese. Uh, explain that uh, that factor and what it might mean for the president. Sure. So that that is certainly a risk factor for uh, both 
getting COVID, becoming infected, and also for severe uh, severe outcomes from COVID. Uh, so it's roughly speaking, uh, as an order like a rule of thumb, if your uh, body mass index, which is a measure of obesity that uh, that, that it's it's uh, that that uh, uh, it puts you in the obese category, roughly speaking, it's it puts you roughly twice the odds of hospitalization, twice the odds of mortality of someone who's not obese. Uh, so I think it is a severe, and there's reasons why that happens. Uh, that that are, I think we're starting to understand from a scientific and medical point of view. Uh, the the virus seems to uh, have a differential attraction for for uh, for lipid cells that are common in obese people. So that's and they think that partly is uh, that partly explains it. Although there's still a lot to learn about that. But from a practical point of view, about twice as much, twice as likely to uh, of a severe outcome from the COVID infection because of a, of his obesity. So, Doctor, the probabilities you're talking about are the population at large, as I understand it. Are there are a couple of factors that might cut in President Trump's uh, favor. For example, he will certainly get the best medical care possible. Uh, and does that make a substantial difference? And by the way, at the same time, have we gotten better at treating the disease just generally? Yeah, that's that certainly makes a difference. Absolutely. Uh, so, for, so in, in, in particular, the uh, the, 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 he, he's going to be able to, uh, the, the doctors around him are going to be sensitive, I, I'm sure, to ch changes in his condition and will react very, very quickly. Uh, he'll, I, I hope he's getting the supportive care he needs because um, that's, that's going to be very important um, as well. We have gotten much better at treating the disease uh, since the early days. In, in the early days, I think uh, the, the, uh, for people who were in the hospital, in the ICU, we were using ventilator protocols that, that were too aggressive, and we backed down on that. Uh, we've gotten uh, this treatments like remdesivir and and, uh, and and steroid treatment for people who advance to their severe viral pneumonia. Most likely, uh, President Trump is not going to advance, but that's but those are, those are available should he need it. Um, and uh, you know there there are, there are other experimental treatments. I don't know what his what his doctors will will decide to do, but uh, but I think yeah we have uh, especially for people who are have progressed toward the more severe disease, we've gotten much better at managing it. Uh, finally, doctor, what about what does it mean for the White House itself, the operations of the White House itself? I mean, it's sort of an unusual circumstance. I mean, he sort of lives above the store, so to speak. He's yeah. really right. He's living where he's working at the same time. What does it mean for the other people of the White House and how far they have to stay away from the president? Yeah, I mean, I think. Um, this is it's not a hospital in a hospital that it's it's possible to isolate uh, it is going to be a challenge i think the because the white house is a is, is a crowded place in some sense um and so many people come to see president trump i think they're going to have to be very creative about that because uh my understanding is that president trump wants to continue to do his daily activities he's, he's the leader of our country and he, sh he kind of needs to if it's possible at all um uh, but he's going to need to do that in a way that doesn't uh, pose a threat of, of of transmitting the disease to the people around him. And I think, uh, you know, I, I, I trust the, that, that they will think of creative ways to do that. There's a lot of resources available for that. Um, Doctor, the president is not only running the country, but he's also running for president for re-election as a practical matter. I've heard stories that, in fact, people with this disease, even people who re rebound, it takes some of the energy away from them. What does it mean for somebody who's got just over a month left in a presidential campaign, which tends to be really demanding? Yeah, fatigue is definitely a, a, a sequela from this disease, even after you recover. So on the other hand, <laughs> President Trump seems to have quite a bit of energy in him. So I, I think uh, there's sort of two things, one cutting one way and one cutting the other. And, and I suppose we'll see. Uh, I mean, in a sense, having the most public person on the face of the earth get this uh, will will be instructive for, for the, the whole world, I think, to see how uh, how it's possible to cope with the disease and uh, how, well to, how well he deals with it, I think, will have a big effect on the public uh, uh, public perception of this disease going forward. Yeah, really important point. Doctor, it's, it's always a treat to have you with us. That's Dr. Jay Bhattacharya. He is from Stanford University, where he is a professor of medicine. Coming up here, we turn to the other big story of the day, the U.S. Jobs Report with Michelle Meyer of Bank of America. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David West, and it's time now for Bloomberg First Word News. And for that, we go to Mark Crumpton. David, thank you. White House Chief of Staff Mark Meadows said that President Trump is, quote, very energetic with mild symptoms from the coronavirus. Meadows says he himself has tested negative, along with other close Trump aides, including his son-in-law, Jared Kushner. Meadows spoke to reporters this morning. And the American people uh, can rest assured that... Uh, we have a president that uh, 
is not only on the job, will remain on the job, and uh, I'm optimistic that uh, he'll have a very quick and speedy recovery. And First Lady Melania Trump wrote in a tweet that she has mild symptoms, but overall is feeling good. Mrs. Trump was also diagnosed with the coronavirus. The Supreme Court has agreed to hear a case that could further weaken the landmark Voting Rights Act. The justices will rule after the election on two Arizona voting policies, including the state's criminal ban on what critics call ballot harvesting. The justices will be giving renewed scrutiny to a law they cut back significantly in 2013. The 1965 measure was designed to protect the rights of black voters at the polling place. The European Union has imposed sanctions against Belarus in an attempt to pressure President Alexander Lukashenko to hold a new election. EU leaders agreed at a summit in Brussels to impose asset freezes and travel bans on 40 officials from Belarus. President Lukashenko himself is not included on the list of sanctioned officials. The EU says the August vote that saw Mr. Lukashenko re-elected was neither free nor fair. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Mark Crumpton. This is Bloomberg. Thank you so much, Mark. So even as Mark was reporting the news, we have some new headlines coming across. Uh, the Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi, says that they are reaching a pact on the airlines, and she's urging airlines to delay further job cuts. United Airlines stock is up on the news. In the meantime, we also have a report of MSNBC, at least, that Vice President, former Vice President Biden has tested negative for COVID-19. So breaking news even as we come to air. President Trump's diagnosis of COVID-19 was big news today, without a doubt, but it's not the only big news. The Labor Department also released U.S. jobs numbers for last month, which fell a bit below what had been expected. To interpret the numbers for us, we welcome now Michelle Meyer, head of U.S. economics for Bank of America. No one better to interpret these for us, but give us your take on it. Are we disappointed, Michelle? It was a little bit weaker than expected, but not meaningfully so. So the headline numbers, you know, it came in a bit soft, but when you look at private job growth, it was pretty close to expectations, you know, running just above 850,000 for, for job growth for the private sector. Um, and when you think about the reasons the headline disappointed, it was because there was a pretty big pullback in state and local government spending, um, state and local government hiring, particularly around education, which is probably partly a seasonal distortion. Um, so, 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 Michelle, so, could I just jump in there for a moment? Yeah. Because when you when I saw that it's government hiring, I thought, okay, yeah. the stimulus bill right away, because they say the states need more assistance. Is there any connection between those two? Not so much, because you know what's happening around the um, state and local um, hiring uh, for right now for education um, is largely a seasonal distortion. The schools opened at a different time; they opened um, at a different rate. You need a different type of workforce potentially as well. So um, I don't think you should really extrapolate very much from the weakness we saw this month as what will come of the future. That said. Um, clearly, state and local governments have made a very strong case that they're under uh, fiscal stress. And in the medium term, as you look several quarters out, you can start to see more uh, notable cutbacks of spending as a result of a lack of additional aid. But I don't think today's report, the cutback in, in on the education side, can really be attributed to that, per se. Michelle, Michelle, one of the things we've seen so far in this downturn has been that some of the minority groups, women, not a minority group, but women, have come back slower <laughs> than they have in prior recessions. Similarly, with African Americans and with Hispanics. What did we see this month? So, so one of the things that was really fascinating about the report this month had to do less with the labor demand story, but the labor supply story. The labor force participation rate fell. Um, and that was a key reason for the decline in the unemployment rate. And when you look into the details of, of the drivers of that decline in the participation rate, um, it largely owed to women, prime working age women, that were dropping out of the labor force again. Um, and I think that that, you know, you look, you can hypothesize a variety of reasons. Um, one critical one, presumably, has to do with childcare. With a lot of children, you know, in a hybrid situation, um, still needing support of parents, it's hard to have both parents engaged in the workforce right now. So that, I think, shows some of the, the more, you know, strains um, from the COVID pandemic on the labor force more broadly. Uh, what can we look down the road to try to get indicate where we're going with the, with the jobless situation? And particularly, is it consumer spending? What are we seeing in consumer spending? Yeah, so when you think about the path forward for the labor market, I think it is 
um, very much going to be driven by what's the path for demand. Because at the end of the day, the amount people are spending is going to dictate those revenues for companies, which will dictate the amount of people they can bring back to work. So yes, it is very much closely tied to one another. And on the consumer spending side, the numbers have been very um, favorable. Consumer spending has, has, has seen a, a pretty impressive rebound. Um, and, and I think that that in part owes to the fact that there's been a very strong, what we would call transfer payment from the government to the private sector. Consumers have been able to maintain their purchasing power because they had a good amount of stimulus, um, from, from the government. And obviously there's concerns about what that might look like in the months ahead without another round of stimulus. But I think generally speaking, consumers have been able to go out and spend, and that has been a really big support for the economy and, and helping to maintain a recovery um, and at least get us to where we are so far for the labor market. Okay. As I say, nobody better to interpret these numbers than Michelle Meyer. Thank you so much, Michelle. She is Bank of America head of U.S. economics. And a programming note, more on the U.S. economy coming up at 6 p.m. Eastern time on Wall Street Week. That's tonight. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. Our first thoughts this morning were with President Trump and his family as news broke of Mr. Trump's COVID diagnosis. But it also brings with it even more uncertainty in an already charged election. To give us some initial thoughts about Joe Biden and, and the, what is going on with the campaign, we turn now to our political contributor, Jeannie Zeno. So, Jeannie, even as we're coming to air, we have a statement from the former vice president, Joe Biden's doctor, saying that, in fact, he was tested today for COVID-19 and was negative, as well as his wife, Dr. Jill Biden. So that's good news. Goodness knows we're going to have to go through the government and the campaigns to find out who's positive and negative. What does all this mean? Yeah, I mean, that's very good news, and we're getting, you know, as you've been reporting so many, um, you know, we're hearing from so many people who are thankfully negative, including the vice president, um, former vice president, and the current vice president. Um, for the campaign, I think that's the big question. It looks like the campaign is at least at this point on hold to a certain extent. Um, you know, the president has had to, as you've been reporting, cancel events that were coming forward. I don't know about events that were for, you know, some time out on the calendar. If he's feeling well enough, would he do them and would people be willing to go to them? I mean, those are big ifs. Would other people step in in his wake? You know, the vice president who thankfully has, has tested negative or other people on the campaign, some surrogates, for instance. And then, of course, there's the question of the next two debates coming up. Will those go forward? They're, you know, about two weeks away at this point. So it's really a campaign on hold and a lot of big questions about how you move forward 30 days out of an election when you've now got a president who has tested positive and at least we understand has mild symptoms. Yeah, and of course, we all wish the president well. Whatever we think about politics, one way or the other, I think everybody has to wish the president and the first lady well. At the same time, Almost no matter what happens, we have just over a month left to go in this campaign, and, and it's going to be hard for him to go out and do those big rallies, much less have those in-person fundraising things like he had at Bedminster, New Jersey, just yesterday. That's going to put a crimp in his style a bit, isn't it? Absolutely. You know, obviously echo what you said about wishing him and the First Lady and everybody hope Hicks infected well and a speedy recovery. It does really put a, a hold on the campaign. Here's a president who likes to be out with the people. He likes to hold these big rallies. He was at a fundraiser in New Jersey, as you mentioned yesterday. All of that now on hold. And I think also from a political perspective, this is just what the president does not want to be talking about. Because the question now is if we can't protect the commander in chief, we can't protect his closest advisors, the first lady from this disease, how can we protect all of us? And that's not the message the campaign or the president wants to send. So they've got a big challenge on their hands as to how to turn this around. Obviously, most importantly, when the president is recovered and the first lady and he's able to get back to campaigning. Well, and as you say, Jeannie, the president has been pretty stubbornly behind something like seven points natural, nationally, at least, in, in the election. But beyond that, he also seems to have fallen behind on the fundraising side. That's part of, I think, why he went to Bedminster yesterday, in fact. And he was hoping, as I understand it, to get some big donations and some of those person-to-person, -person, face to face sort of greetings. Does this really put a lot of trouble into his, uh, his fun funding? 
It does. We understand Democrats were, uh, you know, raised the money off of the debate, and then he went to Bedminster, as you mentioned, to raise money, and he is behind, and we've known that for several weeks now. The campaign is running behind in terms of what types of funds they're able to raise. And without the president, who is the person that they want to give to, they want to see when they go to those campaign fundraisers, you wonder how they can continue to raise at this point. You know, this is sort of, though, I will say, unchartered territory. We, I can't remember a time in an American electoral history where we've seen a scenario like this, certainly. So it, anything could really happen. Um, but at this point, it's hard-pressed to imagine that the president himself, at least, could go out. Maybe surrogates go out and fundraise. But I think it's really still hard. And as you mentioned, this is a president who is behind, in, by some estimates, in some of these swing states like Pennsylvania, by you know upwards eight or nine points in some polls, 11 points going into the debate. He needs to close that gap. That's going to take a lot of effort, a lot of time, and a lot of money. And now he is not feeling well, and he's quarantined. And it's not all that easy, I would think, from the Biden side of it either. I mean, how does the former Vice President Biden react to this? We've already seen him tweet out this morning wishing the president and the first lady all good wishes and saying that they'll be in his prayers. But what does he do? Does he suspend campaigning? Has that been done before? You know, I, I can't. I don't remember a time it's been done before, and we just understood that the vice president's campaign was just considering allowing for more canvassing door to door in some of these swing states. And I don't know if they're going to back off of that at this point now, because he and the campaign, I think, have been more reluctant than the president's campaign certainly to campaign in traditional face-to-face -face ways. They were starting to step back from that a little bit and ease up. It sounded like, and now this news hits. So I do think the president, the vice president, rather is going to have to rethink how he goes forward at a time when he really wants to be out talking to people. But again, the vice president has been managing this, you know, in sort of the, uh, you know, very safe way, mask on, distanced. So I think he probably is better situated to continue along where he was than, say, the president's campaign. The president really wanted to be out face to face, and unfortunately for him, can't do that right now. It's certainly too early, Jeannie, to know what's going to go on with the debates. You mentioned the debates. But as a practical matter, is there any chance? Chance that that next presidential debate really happens because that's going to be just about in the two week sort of quarantine period. It is really hard for me to imagine that it does right now, but again, I think a lot's going to depend on the next five to six days how the president feels, how his doctors report that he's feeling. You know, if he has symptoms um, at this point that are mild, do those go away as they have with some people? Do they get worse? Hopefully not. And then I think they're going to have to make a decision. I think it's going to be a while before we know uh, for certain whether he, in fact, is able and ready to enter that debate. And then, of course, other people who would have to be in that room, do they feel safe being there, including the former vice president? So <laughs> I think there's a lot of ifs. A campaign season that's already been, you know, sort of, uh, you know, jaw-dropping in so many aspects. This news overnight just added a whole other element to it. At the same time, what happens with the government? Because we do have something like a stimulus bill and also a possible confirmation hearing for Judge Barrett. Uh, what happens to those? Yeah, the Republicans reporting they will go ahead with with Judge Barrett. I really think there will be reason for Democrats to put the brakes on that to a certain extent at this point. There's been a lot of interaction, even though she did thankfully test negative, we understand. But between her, her people, the White House and Capitol Hill, people on Capitol Hill, I think they're going to have to be very cautious, and I think that the Democrats will have a reason to slow this down a bit. And, of course, we were just getting some movement on the COVID release, release bill in the last 24, 48 hours. That, too, may stall, unfortunately, for all the American people who are suffering and waiting for that bill to be passed. So huge impact on governance. And then, of course, the question, if the president doesn't feel better and feels like he can't govern at this point, how we then have rules of succession that have to be put into place. That's a whole nother complicated question yeah. that needs to be addressed. Yeah, we hope that's down the road. But I will, will say one thing. If it wasn't a one-issue campaign before, I bet it's going to be a one-issue campaign now. It's all going to be about COVID. I think so. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Many thanks. Thank you so much, Jeannie. Great to have you with us. That's our B Bloomberg political contributor, Jeannie Zeno of Iona College. For Bloomberg First Word News, we go now to Mark Crumpton. David, thank you. President Trump is 74 years old, overweight and male. Factors that health experts say put him in a higher risk category of COVID-19 patients. Experts say those factors make him more susceptible to complications than his wife, who is 24 years younger. The White House says the president's case of coronavirus is mild so far with cold-like symptoms. 
In a tweet, First Lady Melania Trump wrote that she and her husband, quote, are feeling good, end quote. Joe Biden's campaign says the Democratic presidential nominee and his wife, Dr. Jill Biden, have tested negative for COVID-19. In August, the Biden campaign said Biden and his running mate, Kamala Harris, would be tested regularly. Mr. Biden was on the debate stage with President Trump for more than 90 minutes earlier this week. Earlier today, the former vice president tweeted that he was wishing President Trump and First Lady Melania Trump a speedy recovery. The president's COVID-19 diagnosis will not affect the Senate's timetable to consider his Supreme Court nominee. Majority Leader Mitch McConnell says the Senate will vote on Judge Amy Coney Barrett's confirmation very soon and that he doesn't anticipate anything that would throw the process off schedule. Four days of hearings are scheduled to begin October 12th. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Mark Crumpton. This is Bloomberg. David. Thank you so much, Mark. Markets have been reacting since news first came of President Trump's diagnosis of COVID-19. Here to help us understand what is happening and more broadly what the election over just over a month away could mean for investors is Brian Levitt. He's Invesco Global Market Strategist. So, Brian, thank you so much. When we first talked about your coming on, it was to talk more broadly about the election. We'll talk about that. But first, how are markets reacting right now to this news of COVID-19 of the president and the first lady? Obviously, volatility is up a bit, and the markets have been selling off. But what I like to watch is, is I have these indicators that I assess where we are in the business cycle from a market perspective. And, you know, the good news is, is that, you know, inflation expectations are largely steady. The dollar's up a little bit, but is not surging. We've seen commodity prices down a little, high yield off a little, but nothing extreme in those markets that would suggest you know, that, that the market is significantly overreacting to this. I think a pullback in equities is to be expected. Any type of policy uncertainty creates market volatility in equities. But the good news is things like the dollar, things like corporate borrowing costs have not changed meaningfully. And I think equities are sort of off the lows, right? And when I, last time I looked at the VIX, it really there was a gap up, but then it sort of came back down. Not all the way, came but part down. of the way back down. That is correct. That is correct. And so, you know, I think what ends up happening is these things happen overnight. You wake up to pretty significant signs of volatility and, and futures down significantly. And then you start to assess more as the news comes out. I mean, thus far, the White House is saying that the case seems relatively mild. We'll, we'll track that and progress that over time. Um, and we also see some signs out of Congress and some indications from Nancy Pelosi that perhaps some type of fiscal deal may emerge out of this. I mean, I think it's too soon to suggest that that's going to be the case, but that could be some small silver lining out of this if some type of fiscal support comes through to provide you know, a cushion to the nation's households and businesses. Yeah, we spoke with the Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi, yesterday, and she basically, as I understood it, said two things. One is she is hopeful, but there's a long way to go. There's still a fair amount of distance between where she is and where her Republican counterparts are. What's the market pricing in right now when it comes to fiscal stimulus? I think the markets are still largely um, skeptical that a fiscal plan may come through. And that's why, you know, earlier, um, some weeks ago, we had seen more of the economically sensitive, sensitive parts of the market become uh, rise to the fore. More recently, in the last few days, it's been more of the, the growth-oriented stocks. And so in that type of environment, you would expect growth stocks to outperform in what's going to be a pretty weak economic world. If, you, if the market were forecasting more stimulus, more support. I think you would have seen more of the economically sensitive names uh, continue to be the winners. That hasn't been the case over the last couple of weeks. So, so let's look out uh, to the election and past the election. To what extent are the markets reacting to the possibility of a Biden presidency versus a Trump presidency? They seem to have quite different approaches to economic uh, uh, regulation. They do. I mean, the betting odds have shifted more overnight to to a, a Biden victory or, or a Democratic sweep. Although, you know, I, I would caution investors about getting too overly, you know, positioning their portfolios too much based on what they think the outcome of the election is. I mean, I know we always try and all size this up and which sectors, industries and stocks will outperform, although it tends not to actually happen. I mean, you you remember back when Trump won in 16, a lot of investors thought financials and energy would be the big outperformers. Of course, it was tech that remained the persistent outperformer. So it tends not to happen. I mean, you would think um, at this point, if Biden were 
Biden were going to Biden were leading um, and his odds were increasing, you would think that you would see things like renewable energy or international equities or municipal bonds be big winners. There's nothing that, you know, I don't think we've seen substantial moves in those names to suggest that the market is pricing in a Biden victory. Sure, the betting odds went up overnight, um, but I suspect that that'll tighten again uh, as we progress over the next days. In another world, in a different era, you also might think that the bond market might move because uh, Vice President Biden really wants to spend a lot of money, maybe tax a lot as well, but really borrow a lot of money. But given what the Fed has done, does that just take that off the table for the markets? When the Fed's going to keep short-term interest rates low almost indefinitely, you would expect longer-term rates to move as the uh, trajectory of the economy improves. So 10-year interest rates at 60, 70 basis points is pretty overbought given what the likely growth trajectory of this country is. And so if we, when we, I shouldn't even say if we, when we stage a recovery um, interest rates should start to trend higher if you have a fiscal deal and greater spending from a Biden administration to support that, then, yeah, you would expect to see interest rates move higher. But I wouldn't think substantially so. I mean, again, consider it this way. Trend growth in this country is probably about 2 percent. The 10-year rate is around 60, 70 basis points. It tells you it's overbought. Rates over time should move back closer to 2 percent. But that will obviously depend on our ability to contain COVID and reengage with the economy, irrespective of the outcome of this election. Brian, whether it is a President Biden or a President Trump, either way, after November 3rd, uh, are the markets at all reacting to the possibility it won't be over November 3rd? That, in fact, this could yeah, drag I out mean, for some it, time. <laughs> It may not be over after November 3rd. I think we've all sort of uh, recognized that, unfortunately. And you know, we lived through this in 2000 with Gore and, and George W. Bush. And from the day of that election, which was November 7, 2000, through the middle of December when the Supreme Court ruled, the market was down about 5 percent. Now, that was a different environment because— um, you know, we were we were in the early stages of a recession. The Fed had just raised interest rates. Stocks were very expensive to bond. So this is a little bit of a different environment. But to the extent that we don't know the outcome of the election for a while, yeah, you should expect some volatility in markets. I would advise investors, though, always ask yourself two questions. Over the next couple of years, do you expect the economy to improve, and do you expect monetary policy to be supportive of that? I answer both of those questions emphatically yes right now, and that doesn't change if we don't know the outcome of the election for a handful of weeks. Uh, so finally, uh, as you look forward, what is your advice to investors overall? Investors seem to be sort of sitting on their money today. They're a little reluctant. Should people really be reluctant to put money to work right now? Yeah, I think investors should should. I don't think investors should be reluctant to put money to work. Uh, it's always it's the time in the market, not the timing the market. I believe that investors put far too much emphasis on elections. I mean, I, I've been alive 44 years. I was born with Gerald Ford as president. I've obviously lived through every president up through uh, Donald Trump. Every president of my lifetime, with the exception of George W. Bush, has not only experienced positive returns. In the market, they've experienced positive double-digit returns in the market. When you're getting positive double-digit returns in the market, that's a double every seven years or faster. And so investors not allocating because of elections are, you know, pushing back against that history, which suggests that markets tend to go up over time and they tend to have done just fine um, regardless of which party or which politician occupied the executive branch of government or occupied the White House. Brian, this has been very helpful. Thank you very much for being with us. That's Brian Lovett. He's a global market strategist at Invesco. And we'll have more on the market and the election coming up on Wall Street Week at 6 p.m. Eastern tonight. Coming up here, we return to Ohio as this week's subject for our Swing State series and talk with Ohio Secretary of State Frank LaRose. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. 
All this week, we've been looking at Ohio as part of our swing state series leading up to the election. Secretaries of state look to play an even larger role than they usually do in elections, given the concerns over COVID-19 and the increased reliance on absentee ballots in many states. Today, we welcome the Ohio Secretary of State. He is Republican Frank LaRose. So, Mr. LaRose, thank you so much for being with us. Give us a snapshot of where you are in the voting process in Ohio. How many absentee ballots are you going to have? How are you going to process them? Yeah, thanks, David. So it's important for Ohioans to know that there are three great choices that exist. And by the way, this isn't something new that we just had to come up with this year. For close to two decades, Ohioans have had these three great choices. That's a whole month of absentee voting. And, and you mentioned that we're encouraging Ohioans to do it. I sent one of those absentee ballot request forms to every Ohio voter. We've already had over two million Ohioans request their absentee ballots for the first week in October. That is incredible. That's more than double what we've seen in any election in the past. And that's something that we're excited about. But also, Ohioans have a month of early voting. You, you don't have to wait for Election Day. We have Election Month. It begins this coming Tuesday at 8 a.m. We have 216 hours of early voting. So if you like that in-person experience, then you can have it starting this coming Tuesday. And then, of course, the polls will open at 6.30 on Election Day in a safe and healthy environment. If you're comfortable going to the grocery store, you should feel comfortable coming to the polling locations as well. Well, it sounds like you're making it pretty easy for people, which is a good thing, encouraging people to vote. Uh, give us some, some, some sense of deadlines. On the absentee ballots, if people request an absentee ballot, first of all, when do they have to request it by? And second, when do they have to get it to you by? Yeah, so uh, again, the good news is that a lot of people are already doing it. The law says you can wait as late as the Saturday before the election. That is a very bad idea. Effectively, we're telling voters do not wait past the 27th of October just to allow for the logistics. But really, there's no reason to wait. If you didn't get the form that we mailed you, uh, you can print your own at VoteOhio.gov, or you can even go there and get instructions for how to make your own just using a plain blank piece of notebook paper. Uh, and so that's something that Ohioans should do right now. And then if you're going to mail in your ballot, don't delay either. We want you to, to get that back as soon as you can. Those are going to start going out October 6th. As soon as you get it, you should fill it out and mail it back to your county board of elections. And in Ohio, you can track your ballot by going to VoteOhio.gov and making sure that the board of elections has received it. Now, the deadline is Tuesday, or Monday, rather, November 2nd. As long as it's postmarked by, one, by, by Monday, November 2nd, it has 10 days to arrive at the Board of Elections. David, one other important deadline that I want to mention is the voter registration deadline. Ohio's Constitution says you got to be registered to vote 30 days before the election. That means this Monday, October 5th, is the final day to get registered to vote. I've got all the boards of elections in the state staying open late till 9 p.m., but of course, you can do it online at voteohio.gov, and it's more convenient than ever. Ohioans should check their registration and make sure it's up to date. So you got, you say, 2 million uh, so far uh, possible mail-in ballots. Uh, when do you start counting them? How long will it take before we know what they are? So the good news here in Ohio is that we can start to process them immediately. What that means is that once the Board of Elections receives it, they can cut it open, verify your identity, check your signature, flatten it out. And sometimes people take for granted they have to be flattened out so they can go through the scanner. And then as soon as the polls close at 730 on election night, we can begin tabulating them. And so really, the first uh, results that we start to get in Ohio are those results from the early and absentee votes. In some states, they can't even start cutting them open until Election Day. And so thankfully, in Ohio, we'll be ahead of the curve on, on that. Uh, so there's been a lot of litigation around the country we've seen already. Some people say it's over 245 lawsuits filed already on this election. How are you doing in Ohio? Is there much contentiousness over this? You know, unfortunately, it's become just uh, something that we have to expect uh, some of these come with uh, uh, maybe a certain partisan motivation behind them. That's unfortunate. Uh, some of these lawsuits that people file just, you know, five, six weeks before a presidential election, uh, of course, cause concern. Our lawyers are working hard on that. But I'm not getting distracted by any of that. Our eyes on the, the, the ball and, and the work that we have to do. We're recruiting poll workers. We're making sure that our boards of elections are ready for the record high volumes of absentee votes they're going to get. And we're getting accurate information out to Ohio voters. And so as much as, you know, that 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 uh, legal process has to play itself out, that's not distracting us right now. Uh, so, so as I understand it, you've gotten involved in at least one of these lawsuits, and it has to do with uh, adding a, a ballot drop boxes. You got sued, by, and, and the judge, I think, said maybe you, you had to let them do it. What's that about? Well, and, and, and this has gone back and forth at different levels of the courts right now. I mean, in Ohio, uh, the law is very clear. My job is to carry out the law. I'm not going to comment on pending litigation. But again, my job is to do what the clear uh, wording of the Ohio Revised Code said is, it says. And Ohioans know that when it's time to return your absentee ballot, 
Uh, the right way to do that is to mail it in. That's the way that Ohioans have done it for a long time. But we also now make available at every one of Ohio's 88 county boards of elections a secure 24-7 drop box. And so that's a that's a plan B. If you don't want to mail it in, you can drop it off at the board of elections in a secure drop box. That's what the law allows, and that's exactly what we're doing here in Ohio. Uh, the big news of the day, I, I must say, is, of course, the diagnosis of the president and the first lady uh, with COVID-19. And it raises the question for everyone how COVID-19 and the serious of this disease, which is being driven home every single day, how it may affect the voting process in Ohio. Yeah, of course, we keep the first family uh, in our prayers as well as all Americans that are uh, that are dealing with the uh, with the ramifications of, of this deadly and, and dangerous virus. Uh, you know, Election Day is going to look like Election Day has for a long time. Uh, when you show up at the polls, you'll be greeted by a poll worker that's uh, they're smiling to see you, but you're not going to see them smiling because they'll be wearing a mask. Of course, voters are expected to wear a mask as well. We've put out a 48-point checklist that was devised with the CDC and the Ohio Department of Health. That 48 points, maybe it's my military background. I love checklists. It gives the boards of elections clear instructions for what to do, spacing the machines apart, having hand sanitizer and wiping down the machines, making sure uh, that we have the, uh, the, the, the shields in place where the voters and the poll workers have to come close to one another, having an indoor separate from an outdoor, all of these health protocols that, again, if you feel comfortable going to the grocery store, you should feel comfortable coming to your polling location because a lot of the same health protocols will be in place. So as a Republican, Mr. Secretary of State, do you think that the elevation of this COVID-19 issue, as it certainly is elevated even further by the, the very sad news about the president and the first lady, uh, do you think it'll affect the results in Ohio one way or the other? Is COVID-19 being the number one issue going to affect the outcome in Ohio? You know, I think we're going to have record turnout in Ohio, and I think that's a great thing. Uh, in fact, uh, I've got a, a wager with my friend, the Secretary of State of, of Michigan, and it's not about what happens on the football field. That's gotten predictable between Ohio State and Michigan. Oh. Our wager is all about voter turnout, and uh, and I know that Ohio is going to surpass the, the number that Michigan has. But in all seriousness, we want to see Ohioans participate at a record number. We know that they will. We know that we're also going to have a record number of early votes and absentee votes, and and uh, and I'm excited to see that. You know, we've learned a lot through this experience that really really has made elections administration stronger in Ohio. I just concluded a conversation with elections officials all throughout the state that we have this weekly meeting called the Ready for November Task Force. Mm -hmm. And this was the last of our Ready for November Task Force meetings. And we were talking about, uh, you know, none of us would have wanted to go through this experience, but as a result of it, uh, Ohio's elections are stronger and better prepared than ever. And I'm confident that when the final results are tabulated and released, that Ohioans will be confident that it was the voice of Ohio that was heard in our elections. And, and, and that's the bottom line. So it was a pleasure having you with us, despite that cheap shot at my Michigan Wolverine. So I'll just let that go by the wayside. We'll see how it comes out. But thanks so much. That is Frank LaRose. He is Ohio Secretary of State. Coming up, we're going to talk about the significance of the COVID-19 with our reporter from Washington. Uh, this is Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David West. We're going to turn now to at least one piece of big news this week, which to this hour, which is the former Vice President Joe Biden has tested negative for COVID-19. We go now to Tyler Pager, our reporter, who's actually with the Biden campaign. So, Tyler, give us a sense of what the reaction from the Biden campaign to the news overnight of President Trump having COVID-19 is. Yeah, obviously, this news jolted the Biden campaign um, as just comes days after Vice President Joe Biden was sharing a debate stage with Donald Trump, adhering to social distancing guidelines. Um, but and the first thing they did was, was set up a test for Joe Biden and Jill Biden and had other aides that were traveling uh, with, with the campaign. Um, so obviously, they're thrilled that, that both uh, Joe and Jill Biden have tested negative for COVID-19. Um, but, but it definitely did uh, it jolt the campaign this morning as, as the president announced his positive test result. OK, Tyler, really appreciate it. That's Tyler Page reporting from the campaign trail with the Biden campaign. And now it's time for a check in the markets. And for that, we turn to Abigail Doolittle. Abigail? Well, David, not surprisingly, it's been a real topsy-turvy day with the Western world waking up earlier to this surreal and sad news that President Trump and Melania Trump have uh, tested positive for COVID-19. But as the day has progressed, we are off the lows. At that time, futures down sharply. It's been a whipsaw day. The Dow is actually fluctuating, trying to turn up. Uh, 
positive. In fact, as investors now assess what could this news uh, mean for the corporate profit outlook. Now, interestingly, this year's uh, defense trade, tech and the stay-at-home names, those stocks are hit more, suggesting that some investors are looking at these in the more traditional role of growth and momentum and suggesting that uh, the initial uh, understandable risk off from stock reaction uh, may not last for any long period of time, David, is the fact that you don't really have a bid for havens. In fact, you don't have a bid at all. Bonds are lower. Uh, the yen is about flat and gold uh, is down just a bit, David. Yeah, it's fascinating. And VIX is up, right? The VIX is up slightly, but not really all that much. There certainly is not a panicked reaction in the market at all. The VIX curve has elevated, suggesting that we will continue to see more volatility into the end of the year around the election. But if this were a true risk-off day signaling uh, that this sad event would somehow immediately affect the corporate profit outlook, you would see a big sell-off, not just for stocks. You would see investors rushing into bonds, rushing into the yen, that VIX spiking. Instead, David, if you can believe it, we actually have the S&P 500 up uh, more than one and a half percent on the week, heading to its first up week since August. In fact, its first up week uh, in five weeks. So there's a bright spot beneath uh, this unfortunate news on the day. So as I understand it from your note, materials is actually the one that's up at the moment. Why is that? Well, you know, they're actually flipping around. The sectors uh, at this point, industrials are now leading. And so the real uh, stock bulls might even say that that's encouraging. The fact that you have the cyclical sectors that have been trying to rise to the top that would signal a real rotation into the recovery stocks and sectors is happening and that is in fact the case industrials up the most right behind it materials which could be a positive around the commodities and that's something else to keep in mind yesterday we had this big commodity uh, sell-off which is not a, a, a good event for risk assets but today commodities about flat so materials higher and then also to your point uh, David Energy right now up 1.2 percent. That sector has been under tremendous pressure recently with oil plunging, but today a bit of a recovery there. Sounds to me like a lot of churn. Thank you so much, Abigail, for explaining it all to us. Coming up, Balance of Power continues on Bloomberg Radio. In our second hour, we're going to talk to with Richard Profalt. He's an expert in elections law. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio.